ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So uh, I would continue with uh, uh, speaking on quoting and misquoting Srila Prabhupada following an essay on this subject by Satsarup Dos Goswami. Uh, <clears throat> he asks in the question, in, in the essay, and then gives the answer, what is the or, or an answer? What is the remedy to this type of misuse of Prabhupada's authority? He said we should repeat only in a general way as a paraphrase anything we do not have a direct quote to prove. Um, I can add to that as a related point that if we're quoting from Srila Prabhupada something that we don't it's it's one of those Prabhupada sets for which there's no uh, confirmed evidence, then, especially if, if speaking in a formal manner, giving a lecture, uh, one may say, I have heard that Srila Prabhupada said this, or Srila Prabhupada is said to have said this, or so-and-so told me that Srila last night I quoted Ravindra Sarup Prabhu, I was having told me personally something that Srila Prabhupada had told him. So like this we can do. And we can also be alert that if someone says that Prabhupada said something, <clears throat> uh, we can ask, well, did Prabhupada say that to you personally? What is the context? And even then, uh, we should be aware that what Srila Prabhupada said to that devotee, he may have remembered it differently, actually, to what was said, as is commonly seen in a police investigation. They may ask direct witnesses to an incident uh, what they saw, what they experienced, and they may give quite varying accounts. And even in Srila Prabhupada's conversation, and we we don't uh, we don't see when we hear the recordings or read the transcriptions we don't see the look in the eyes that may uh, indicate pleasure or displeasure or we may misinterpret uh, even if we do see we may misinterpret. It happens with myself quite a lot. Uh, I must be quite a severe kind of person, uh, seem like that, uh, because quite often it gets back to me that I'd spoken angrily to someone, but I don't remember being angry. But it seemed to them like that. Uh, yeah, and then we should, uh, and, and then he said, I, I'm paraphrasing this, that then Satsuruk Das Goswami says that we should not take as, we should not repeat something that Srila Prabhupada stated to be representative of his position on a, any particular issue, uh, ignoring other quotes which, uh, can give it different perspectives, especially if uh, that one quote gives quite a different perspective to that of the others. In other words, we ourselves should not misquote or misuse Srila Prabhupada's quote to uh, try to substantiate some position that we're personally attached to. Therefore, uh, we have to be free from personal motivation. 
in our in our preaching and presentation of Srila Prabhupada. And even if we're free from personal motivation, um, that we, we, we're doing something and tr- we feel we're doing something in Srila Prabhupada's service, but we may be without personal motivation in, in the sense, personal, the term personal motivation is usually used in the sense to mean that I want to, get, I want to gain from this situation. I have some personal interest, swartha in Sanskritum, let's call that. And it's the, that's a common word in Hindi and other languages. Someone who has their own personal interest at the expense of others. They want to get the most out of the situation and, and at the expense of others. They don't mind. My, my own gain is in mind. So one may not be personally motivated in that way. One may sincerely be... <coughs> speaking and acting in a manner that uh, he perceives to be best in the service of Srila Prabhupada, but may have a personal perspective on uh, what should be done in Srila Prabhupada's service. For instance, now with all the hullabaloo, if you watch the news, Please don't take photographs now. You can take afterwards if you like, but not during the class. Please listen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the American election is still months away and it's big news, all this. Uh, so some devotees, they, they uh, in America, they vote for Democrats. And some vote for Republican. And they both feel, yes, this is the best for Krishna consciousness. The the idea is that I've, I've heard devotees in America discussing, and I've, even many years ago I heard devotees discussing among themselves, well, which is best? The, generally the idea is that, well, Democrat will allow us to, they're more liberal, so they'll allow us to prosecute our activities as devotees they they won't be they they're more broad minded live and let live kind of attitude whereas the republicans they tend to stand more in line with things that we stand in line with such as anti abortion particularly that issue of course there is a purport in which Srila Prabhupada states that you shouldn't vote for anyone unless unless they're going to stop cow killing so that rules out both of them. I don't think that's on the agenda. No, it's definitely not on the agenda in the in any election. In, maybe in India. Maybe in India. Yes, it does come up. That's an. I won't get into that. I could get into a whole thing about how the present government. You'd expect them to do. They're doing something. You'd expect them to do more to stop cow slaughter in India. So we may not be personally motivated. In our, in the sense that we want something for our own sense gratification and therefore we misquote Srila Prabhupada. But we may have a personal perspective as to what is the best way to serve Srila Prabhupada and his mission. And therefore we may quote certain quotes of Srila Prabhupada which favor, which, uh, we can cite to favor that position and tend to downplay, ignore, or explain away quotes that don't uh, fit with that. Or we could say that, well, this is the situation in the world now. We have to be pragmatic. Utility is the principle, time, place, and circumstance. And therefore, for instance, um, we know that Srila Prabhupada wanted to establish Varnashram society, but now is not the right time to do it. So let's put it off for now and get our act together as a society and later uh, we can consider Varnashram. So that is that is a completely different kind of approach where, where you acknowledge that Srila Prabhupada said something, he very much wanted something, uh, but we feel that we're not ready to execute that. 
I would counter to that particular argument that Srila, Srila Prabhupada wanted it um, Barnashram established back in the 1970s and he said it must be done and uh, arguably the, we'll never be ready for it. <laughs> so we have to make the situation, make the world ready for us and start to do it. So anyway, you can see how there, there are, uh, there can be very different perspectives on how to serve Srila Prabhupada, even quoting him. Misquoting is something else. Or, uh, another point that Satsurup Das Goswami makes is that um, sometimes we're not sure, or we may not be sure, or we might be sure and we might be wrong, uh, in an instruction of Srila Prabhupada, whether he's giving an ideal or giving an indication. For instance, Satsurup Das Goswami gives the example. Srila Prabhupada said that temples should give 50% of their income to the BBT. Now, is that meant to be an ideal that temple managers aspire for? If you only have enough money to pay the rent and the utilities bills and there's only uh, one kuna left after all the basic expenses, then how can you give 50% to the BBT? Uh, or is that a minimum requirement? Should, you, should that be done and possibly more given? So that... Uh, Similarly, in the question about householders giving 50% of their income for promoting Krishna consciousness. There are very specific directions in Srila Prabhupada's books about that. So we may insist it must be done. You're not bona fide unless you do it. But then we find in one letter that Srila Prabhupada said that no one's pushing you to do that. If you can't do it, then don't. Again, I'm paraphrasing. So, um, in this regard, Satsuru Das Goswami uh, quotes from the Nectar of Devotion. One should not accept more than necessary if he is serious about discharging devotional service. And uh, the purport is that one should not neglect following the principles of devotional service, nor should one accept the rulings of devotional service which are more than what he can easily perform. For example, it may be said that one should chant the Hare Krishna mantra at least 100,000 times daily on his beads. That's actually the standard. For all that's understood to be the standard in our Gorya tradition. Uh, not that everyone in the Gorya tradition did it, but that's understood to be the standard. One lakh of names a day. But, Srila Prabhupada continues in this purport, but if this is not possible, then one must, min one must minimize his chanting according to his own capacity. It is better if one is fi uh, if one fixed up a regulated principle according to his own ability and then follows that without fail, that will make him advanced in spiritual life. And of course, Srila Prabhupada set the minimum for uh, initiated devotees, his followers, as 16 rounds, one quarter of the 100,000 names. So, continuing, that quote is finished. Um, in the particular case of the temples giving 50% of their income to the BBT, the GBC decided that this was in the category of an ideal aspiration. But, and then he distinguishes, the instruction to chant 16 rounds and follow the four regulate principles is a vow, and we have to adjust our lives to fulfill that. Uh, then he writes, taking too many documented instructions as ideals is dangerous. 
I, I don't really follow the uh, the logic here. Any suggestions can be done. Hmm? Well, he's saying the opposite. That to, to take everything as the ideal is dangerous. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. I see. Yeah. In other words, you say that, well, that's the ideal, but you don't really have to follow it. I see. Okay. Thank you. Right, right, right. I took it round the other way, actually. I thought that, well, if you have all this, then this... It, it, I took ideal in the sense that you have to follow it. Yeah. Yeah, that's an example of how could be mis you know, any statements can be misunderstood. It can also become offensive to think that Prabhupada's ideals are impossibilities. Very good insights that Prabhupada said this should be done. This should be. no, no, no. That's for fanatics. Ever heard that before? And then he goes on to write that this is a movement for idealists. Very good uh, observation. Yeah, we're we're here to pursue the ideal of pure devotional service to Krishna. Hmm? Impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. Srila Prabhupada quoted from which Shastra was that? Napoleon. <laughs> so there you see, you can you can quote from anywhere if it fits. Achintya Kalu Ye Bhava. Natangs Tarkaina Yojya Prakritabia Parang Yachta Tad Achintyasya Lakshanam. Don't try to understand that which is Achintya, but because the very meaning is you can't understand it. Not by the process of Tarka, not by the process of logical inquiry. And of course, elsewhere uh, there are many statements that Krishna reveals himself to devotees with whom he is pleased. So devotees are idealists. Uh, um, this is a movement for idealists. So it is possible to convert uh, a an idealistic movement into a more practical functioning movement. Uh, in other words, a religion. Uh, to get on to get on with the world, to fit into the world. It's much easier not to be idealistic. It's much easier to fit in the world if we don't strive for ideals which most of the people in the world have no uh, or, or very little sympathy with. Uh, they may be opposed to it. They may, uh, they may think that you're very wrong. All this talk, you're not the body. That means you're not Croatian. That means you don't, you wouldn't join the Croatian army if they went to fight against the Serbs. It's not quite time for that yet, but it'll come again, no doubt. So to to strive for an idea for. Otherworldly. There's a word in English, otherworldly. That is a derogatory term used for spiritual idealists who don't want to fit into this world, whose aim is Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padang Sada Paschanti Suryo, looking up at the Lord in the spiritual world. Of course, that's not 
in the English derivation of otherworldly. But the idea is that that not practical, not grounded in this world, and uh, many people who claim to be religionists or spiritualists would say, "Now forget all this stuff, you know, all this God in the spiritual. Let's let's serve God here." Daridra Narayana. Forget about God in, in Vaikuntha. The poor man in the street, you should serve him. That is real religion. That's better than, what are you doing for anyone? Just sitting in your cave, doing some yoga, trying to become liberated. What is the use? It's no good to you nor anyone else. So they, the term otherworldly suggests people who are considered dropouts, parasites, corruptors of the youth that uh, claim was made against Socrates. He's corrupting the youth by talking all this philosophy. So, uh, we are idealists. And to be an idealist means to stand against the mass of people. We don't that's our principle is not to oppose the mass of people. It's not that our aim and object is to do so, but it's a natural corollary of being so different to them. So we have to be prepared to face that um, and try to fulfill the orders of Srila Prabhupada despite it being unpopular. Not that we ne- not that we try to be unpopular, uh, but at the same time we shouldn't try to be popular at the expense of uh, diluting Srila Prabhupada's instructions. Now, I'm getting off the topic here because the topic is supposed to be quoting and misquoting Srila Prabhupada, but I'm giving what could be said to be my understanding of how we should follow Srila Prabhupada. As opposed to those who would say that, well, Srila Prabhupada didn't like that people would dislike us, so we should try to be popular. Make it practical. If we say that you have to follow all these principles, if we emphasize that too much, then uh, we, people won't come to Krishna consciousness. So if, if we tell everyone all the principles uh, then they won't uh, they won't follow. And how are we going to spread the movement? Just a few days ago in Russia, I was initiating, and the day before, or the day before, one couple came up to me and said, "Oh, we just were told that that uh, no illicit sex means once a month for procreation, no contraceptives. No one told us they've been practicing Christian consciousness for eight years." And they were just told that no illicit sex means uh, only within marriage. So they didn't know, and they were very concerned. They thought, well, we didn't know. What do we do now? We, we don't, have no, don't have any practice for that. So it's, they, were, they were surprised. So it, it may be that uh, we make it easy, because we often hear about the fourth principle. I don't know why it's called the fourth. It could also be called the first or the second or the third. And and there's no particular order for them anyway. But it's often the fourth principle means no illicit sex. And it's something, it seems, that uh, is not always preached about, the full, the full ramifications of that, be, being afraid that people will go away. We want to bring people in. The problem with, well, there are many problems with that. Uh, one problem is uh, not properly representing Srila Prabhupada, um, how, what he instructed us to do. Of course, in the beginning, it's it's not that someone says, oh, welcome to the Hare Krishna temple. First time coming? Oh, yes, okay. Well, uh, you know, only once a month. <laughs> it's, it's, we don't preach like that. So, uh, at least... I don't. Someone might do. But uh, but if someone's been around for eight years, hmm, someone should have told them. <laughs> but it seems that from that, 
They're from St. Petersburg, the second city of Russia. So, uh, it, probably all the devotees there, and, and what maybe throughout Russia, I don't, I don't know. I didn't investigate it further. Maybe they feel that they're in competition with the Gorya Mat there. Apparently, the Gorya Mat or Gorya Mats are more prominent there than Iskon. So, uh, Gorya Mat tends to make things easy. So, make it easy. Otherwise, no one will come to us. They come to Isco and say, you'd have to follow this, 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 and this. And the government says, no, 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 problem. Come and get us. Yeah, you get initiated. When? Uh, after. We're having a ceremony right now. You know, we're not having a ceremony, but anyway, we'll initiate you right now. It's a, catch them while you can. Yeah. So, uh, and people are saying, oh, okay, that's great. You get the same benefit. You get a guru's mercy and you don't, you don't need to follow up. If you can get if you can get Krishna consciousness without having to follow all these things, great. Why bother? Um, but then, then the idealism is broken. Um, so, Srila uh, Prabhupada. Uh, no, I'm missing. Yeah. So, Sasura Das Goswami writes. That quoting Srila Prabhupada with personal motivation or to prove one's own philosophy is more serious than quoting him in ignorance of the source of Prabhupada's statements or quoting Srila Prabhupada's statements inaccurately. Of course, if we deliberately quote them inaccurately, there's a problem with that also. Uh, here, uh, Satsura Das Goswami quotes about the Mayavadis, uh, how they quote on the Bhagavad Gita, they, they quoting from Srila Prabhupada in a Chaitanya Charitamrita Prabhupada, they give up the real, easily understood meaning of Vedic literature and introduce commentary based on their own imaginative power to prove their own philosophy. So this is the, the same point in taking Shastra, in taking Srila Prabhupada's quotations, of course, 90, more than 90% of Srila Prabhupada's statements that you, he may, even if he doesn't directly quote Shastra, you can, they're traceable to Shastra. Uh, you, 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 you could go through all Srila Prabhupada's lectures and line by line you could give substantiation from Shastra. Um, but then there are other points which arise just like eating chocolate and uh, which un, which might not be so easily uh, tra- uh, uh, derivable from Shastra because chocolate is not mentioned in Shastra. The Srila Prabhupada in this case invoked for Srila Prabhupada the, the point to be considered was whether or not it is intoxicating. And then when he was told that there's um, intoxic- some intoxicating ingredients, then he said, then we, we shouldn't take it. And then again, someone states that the amount of intoxicant is extremely low. And, you know, arguments go on and on. My, my take on that is that, well, it's not required in devotional service. So, and mostly devotees, they're not thinking, oh, how... I'd love to offer chocolate to Krishna. They're thinking about, I want to eat chocolate. <laughs> so let's offer it to Krishna. So it may not be such a bad thing, but as there's no gain in devotional service by taking it, uh, then why, why, why take it at all? Why bother? Uh, by the way, um, in chocolate production, there's also uh, much killing of bugs and this and that. So along with your chocolate, you get uh, finely powdered bug bits and pieces. 10%. No, you're not allowed to have more than 10% bugs. Really? Is that... 
Really? Insects are the food of the future. The United Nations said insects are the food of the future. <laughs> Meanwhile, humans are the food of insects. You get buried and people come and put some flowers at your grave and in the meantime the insects underneath are having a feast. <laughs> I thought it was, in the 1970s, oil was the food of the future. There's one conversation in which Srila Prabhupada's devotees tell Prabhupada they're going to make food from oil. There's some other prospect to make it from stool. Hmm? Made food from stool? In Japan. Right, right, eating stool. I, I remember reading, uh, getting off subject here. I remember reading as a kid some account of someone who was in some concentration camp. I believe it was in Russia during the Second World War. And uh, some of the people there read stool because nothing else, not much else to eat. Okay, as we're on the subject of macabre discussions of Srila Prabhupada, there was, in the 1970s, uh, an airplane crashed in the Andes Mountains in South America. Some of the people were killed and others weren't. And it took quite a few days before they, they could be rescued. And uh, the ones that were alive ate the bodies or bit parts of the bodies of the killed people. And there were, that became a big discussion, a moral discussion in the world. Should they have done it or not? Srila Prabhupada said immediately, yes. In that situation, you should do it. Okay, getting back to this more or less entertaining subject matter. Prabhupada's conversations are very entertaining. If you like spiritual entertainment, you can read that. Because devotees that They'd look through all the newspapers and magazines and find all things like that and bring them to Prabhupada and, and get Srila Prabhupada's reactions. That's one of the reasons why they're, why they're very spiritually entertaining. Uh, then, Satsuru Das Goswami continues, There are examples where interpretation of Shastra is required, such as in the Ishopanishad mantra, The Supreme Lord walks and does not walk. Actually, in the mantra itself, the the term, the Supreme Lord, does not appear. The Mayavadis interpret that to mean that, that the ineffable entity that is not, uh, that is the impersonal Brahman. So they take it to mean that. Although it is the Isha Upanishad, and Isha Vasyamidam Sarvam. So the subject is Isha, but somehow the, Isha means the Supreme Lord. But somehow they, the Mayavadis, they take Isha, the supreme controller, to mean something impersonal. Anyway, so there's that, that statement is there. Um, what is that? Uh, what is that? Javano Grihita, Pashantya Chakshu, the statements in other Upanishads also. Uh, he accepts, although he has no hands, he accepts items. Uh, although he has no eyes, he sees. Uh, so, how is this to be understood? He walks and he doesn't walk. So, the Vaishnava understanding, kindly given to us by Srila Prabhupada, is that uh, he walks, but not in exactly the way that we walk, because our walking is by a material body and his walking is by a, a spiritual body. He has no eyes, means he has no material eyes, but he sees everything. He has eyes everywhere. Uh, stated in the Bhagavad Gita, what is that verse? Sarvata. Pāṇipādam tat sarvato kṣi shiro makam sarvata 
Akshi. His eyes are everywhere. He has no eyes, but his eyes are everywhere. So uh, those who are Krishna conscious will be able to understand these texts according to Vaishnava Parampara. Enemies of Krishna consciousness, however, distort the meanings of many texts to prove that Srila Prabhupada had a devious mentality or that he supported cruelty to women. This essay was written long before uh, Iskon's cultural divide manifested. It wasn't uh, it was, his writing this was not part of the uh, it wasn't part of the political, whatever you want to call it, ongoing discussion. So yeah, there, there, from the beginning, there, there, from very early, there have been people are saying that Srila Prabhupada is sexist, racist, what else? Homophobic. I don't think that word even existed. Was it? When you were young, did you ever hear that word? No, because everyone is homophobic. Except <laughs> that was normal. That was expected. So, uh, he writes that, that it's not right to use his Prabhupada teaching to hurt another person. Uh, so, Srila Prabhupada wrote in one letter, Pre- that preaching is not easy, it is the inactivity of an advanced devotee. So, someone may t- take this statement, preaching is for advanced devotees. I'm preaching, therefore I'm advanced. You're not preaching, you're not advanced. That is a misuse of Srila Prabhupada's statements. One is not supposed to, the Vaishnav mood is not to try to present oneself as being advanced. If one thinks that he's advanced, he's not advanced. Uh, and, uh, he quotes another letter of Srila Prabhupada, the Kanishta Adhikari can also achieve perfection. If one does not preach, it does not mean that he is fallen, condemned. It is not artificial. One gradually becomes perfect by association. In another letter, Srila Prabhupada says, we should be reformed by amicable dealings. Amicable means friendly. So if there's some, if we see that someone is doing something wrong, we should try to reform by amicable dealings as far as possible. Um, that I mentioned previously, misuse of authority, taking Srila Prabhupada's teachings. Uh, Srila Prabhupada says that the authorities in ISKCON are to be obeyed and therefore one who's in a position of authority they may misuse that to uh, uh, show their own power or to mistreat devotees. I remember once, in, this just came to my mind after many years, I was uh, in Calcutta Temple and Iskon Calcutta Center in the office, what was called the office, although it doesn't look anything like what would normally be called an office. Um, there were no chairs or tables. But the accountant sat there. You know, they'd sit on the, something like this and have a low desk like that. That was the system. So the town president was sitting there and he asked, where is so-and-so devotee? He said, he's in the Brahmachari Ashram. He said, way up. Go and call him. The, the, after some minutes, the Brahmachari came. And the president said, pick up that piece of paper on the floor. Throw it away. So he did. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> Why? Yeah, so one should not, uh, I, I spoke about that already, that uh, those in a position of authority, they they may, they, 
on the basis of Srila Prabhupada's uh, teachings, uh, they may uh, expect to be obeyed. But uh, at the same time, they should also consider that it is their duty to guide devotees and deal with devotees in their care in a manner which is conducive to those devotees' best interests. Just like a parent has authority over the child, but the parent doesn't misuse that authority, exercises that authority for the benefit of the child, so the child can uh, grow up to be a good citizen, and so on. Uh, then Satsrup Das Goswami goes on to discuss. Oh, he's quoting from one purport. Okay, this is from Srila Prabhupada. Uh, there are some highly qualified persons who accept only the good qualities of others. Just as a bee is always interested in the honey in the flower and does not consider the thorns and co colors, highly qualified persons who are uncommon accept only the good qualities of others not considering their bad qualities, whereas the common man can judge what are good qualities and what are bad qualities. Among the uncommonly good souls, there are still gradations, and the best good soul is one who accepts an insignificant asset of a person and magnifies that good quality. So Srila Prabhupada is uh, describing here a, a principal characteristic of an Uttam Bhagavat, topmost. Vaishnava. He doesn't see any bad qualities in others. Uh, so this is an ideal to be aspired for, but still, as long as we're in this world and operating in this world, and especially if we're trying to preach Krishna consciousness, we have to see what is proper and what is improper. Otherwise, how can we preach? If we think, well, everyone's already perfect, and how can we preach? If you think, well, uh, cow slaughter is going on, but anyway, uh, everyone's good. And then how can we preach? You have to say, no, this is bad. This is, people are acting in, in, in ways that are uh, detrimental to their own self-interest. We should tell them. We should inform them. Uh, then uh, Satsuru Das Goswami points out Lord uh, Rishabhadev's advice not to be angry with followers even if they don't, even if they can't follow. Uh, there is a verse uh, spoken by Rishabhadev. Uh, you can find that in the fifth canto of Bhagavatam in which he states that uh, the spiritual master should instruct the disciple and not become angry even if he doesn't follow, even if he can't follow properly. Of course, we know that Srila Prabhupada often did become angry with his followers, but it was a directed anger for their rectification. Not that he became angry in the sense of wanting to be vengeful on them or to punish them. There's a, there's a difference. There's a difference in the kind of anger that Lord Shiva's followers vented on Daksha and his followers. When they, they wanted to punish them. Uh, and the anger of a parent or a well-wisher who, uh, for the benefit of the ward, uh, shows anger to make an impression. That don't do this. It's, it's, it's for their benefit. It's for the benefit of the follower, not for the, uh, not for letting out the stress of the uh, of the leader or the parent or the guru. Uh, Satsuru Das Goswami gives an example of uh, how Srila Prabhupada said no illicit sex and he said we should preach this in an objective way not an insulting, accusing way. Mm. Objective way what do we understand by that? that we, we talk about the the uh, 
the demerits of illicit sex. Maybe in a, maybe not not insulting or accusing, but in a demeaning manner, we can also. As Srila Prabhupada often did, I mean, illicit sex, cats and dogs. You're, people are living like cats and dogs. They have sex with no discrimination. They, they, they're uncontrolled. So that is, of course, it could be taken as insulting, but it's also objective. So to call a thief a thief is not wrong. But it, again, our attitude should not be that uh, what's called in English, holier than thou. I'm better than you. You're just a cat and a dog. I'm a high-class Brahmin. And to hell with you. You're just nonsense. So not in that style. Otherwise we could end up with, as that's noted in one of Srila Prabhupada's books, one of those small books, the high-class Brahmin who is always uh, blaming the prostitute and the Brahmin had to take a low birth, had to go to hell because of thinking of a prostitute when he's supposed to be a Brahmin. And she went back to Godhead because she was thinking of Krishna despite her uh, low class occupation. Uh, Then, quoting Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Satsuru Goswami quotes him um, from one of Srila Prabhupada's purports in Chaitanya Charitamrita. One often thinks of conducting business to improve devotional activity. However, the contamination is so strong that it, that it may later develop into misunderstanding. That's a very important point, that we may think of doing something for the sake of devotional service. But then the motive can change because the, the contamination is so strong. It may be that one has a desire to do business and make money for oneself, but he wants to dovetail that in Krishna consciousness. But that again becomes... Uh, that the, the material side, our material motive becomes stronger than the spiritual motive. And then, uh, however, the contamination is so strong that it may later develop into misunderstanding, described as kultinati, fault-finding, and pratishtasha, the desire for name and fame and for high position, jiva hingsa, envy of other living entities, nishidacha, accepting things forbidden in the Shastra, karma, desire for material gain, and puja, hankering for popularity. The word kuti nati means duplicity. As an example, one may attempt to imitate Srila Haridash Tako by living in a solitary place. One's real desire may be for name and fame. In other words, one thinks that fools will accept one to be as good as Haridash Tako, just because one lives in a solitary place. These are all material desires. A neophyte devotee is certain to be attacked by other material desires as well, women and money. In this way, the heart is again filled with dirty things and becomes harder and harder, like that of a materialist. Gradually, one desires to become a reputed devotee or an avatar. So, yeah, this is in the discussion of various motivations, why we mis may misquote Srila Prabhupada. Okay, I'll just read one more quotation that he gives, Satsuv Das Goswami gives. Um, yeah, no, no, first of all, he discusses the desire for power and ambition. The desire for power and ambition. It's not that, yeah. There are other weeds that may appear in the heart. These may be motivations whereby we, maybe we don't even recognize that we're misquoting Srila Prabhupada. We may think, I'm doing it all for Krishna. But actually in our heart, there's a desire for power or there's some ambition to be recognized as a great devotee. Uh, uh, then, the, quoting from one of Srila Prabhupada's purports, 
in the ninth canto of Bhagavatam, describing the narration about Durvasa Muni's um, enmity towards Maharaj Ambarish. Um, Austerity and learning are auspicious for the Brahmana, but when acquired by a person who is not gentle, such austerity and learning are most dangerous. Srila Prabhupada states in the purport that Dilvasamuni was not a gentleman because he didn't know how to use his power and was therefore dangerous. So if we have power, we may power means some position in the Krishna consciousness movement. We may misuse that power and misquote Srila Prabhupada to bolster our position. A quotation from Srila Prabhupada in this regard, from the ninth canto. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is never inclined toward a dangerous person who uses his mystic power for some personal design. By the laws of nature, therefore, such misuse of power is ultimately dangerous, not for society, but for the person who misuses it. So, if we suspect that we're, we may not be properly quoting Srila Prabhupada, we may think, well, I need to do so to, to effect some activity, uh, but that can be very dangerous uh, for our own self to misuse that power. So I'm stating all these things. Uh, Obviously, I have some kind of position within the Krishna conscious movement, so I'm not saying that uh, I'm devoid of the tendency to misuse this. So this is, going through this is also, hopefully, educational for myself. So I, so I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm sitting here and saying that, yeah, I got it all worked out and you're all wrong. Um, but these are important points that should be discussed. And this, this essay was actually written uh, many years ago, which um, we may think that at the present time there are so many issues going on in ISKCON, but there there always have been and probably always will be as long as this gone exists because human society is like that. In the in the uh, first center in New York City in the storefront, there may have been issues as uh, there might have been issues such as uh, someone comes here only to eat, he never gives any money and he eats 20 chapatis every day. Should we say something to him or not? Which is not such a big issue as um, should we condone gay marriages in ISKCON or not? But it's but probably to the devotees at that there was something like that. So the devotees at that whatever the issue is, we always think it's huge, major. Some actually are, and some aren't. And they, the issues arise not necessarily from... They may arise from someone misusing their position, misquoting Srila Prabhupada. It may just arise just... That's the way Krishna made everything. People are different. So Srila Prabhupada also talks about spiritual differences between devotees. If their desire is to serve Krishna, then even though they may disagree, if they're both actually sincere, then the uh, it's said to be a spiritual difference. But then again, it's not necessary that every difference within ISKCON is spiritual, because there can be personal motivations also. Life is complex. That's why it's good to have kirtan and just forget all these things, at least time to time. And chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Hare Krishna. I'll finish there for now. There's more coming. Still another three pages. Also, two and a half pages. Hare Krishna, all glories to Srila Prabhupada.